Okay, lesson 6-6 six, six. <laughs> is trig form of a complex number. Now, when I say complex number, do you remember what a complex number is? With I. With I. So we're talking a little bit about I. Nothing big. You, really, the I is just there. We're not really doing anything with I. But um, we are talking about what trig form of a complex number looks like. Now, Let's do a little bit of Algebra 2 review for a moment. Enjoy your Algebra 2. If you recall, a complex number is of the form A plus BI, where A represents the real part and B represents the imaginary part. Okay, so A plus BI, Z is your common variable that represents a complex number. And when we look at the complex number A plus BI as an ordered pair, it can be written in the form A comma B, where it's real part comma imaginary part. We practiced graphing these a little bit last year in Algebra 2. I don't know how much you remember, but it was easy, so it will come back pretty easily. In order to graph something like 3 minus 4i, well, first of all, we have to think about what that is as an ordered pair. So if it's 3 minus 4i, what is that going to be if we do real comma imaginary? 3 comma negative 4, okay? A 3 representing the real part and the negative 4 representing the imaginary part, which is the coefficient of i. We graph it just like an xy ordered pair. X, I mean, other than it's not an x-axis and a y-axis, it's a real axis and a imaginary axis. Okay, so you have your real axis and imaginary axis. I think I'm going to count out to five on each axis real quick. Okay, so counting out to five each way. If we're going to graph three minus four i, we're graphing the ordered pair three comma negative four, which is going to take us where? Three right, okay, three right, four down. I'm going to call that point A. What about point B? Negative two. Okay, negative two plus I is going to be represented as negative two comma one. Remembering the imaginary coefficient is one. How do I graph negative two one? Left two, up one, thank you. I'm going to call that point B, just because it's part B. What about C? What about 5i? Zero. Nice. So realizing this is 0 plus 5i, so we're going to think of it as 0, 5, which takes me up 5. Yeah. 0 left to right and 5 up, because 5 was the imaginary coefficient. And lastly, negative square root of 3. Three square root of three. Okay. Negative square root of 3, comma 0, because this would be negative square root of 3 plus 0i, if you want to think about that in the complex form. Where does that take me? It's not like 2.5. 2. Somewhere left or right. Left in between 1 and 2. Okay. Left in between 1 and 2. Can we agree to that? It's negative, which tells me left. Square root of 3 is bigger than 1 and smaller than 2. 1.732, I believe, is the calculator decimal. So, in that case, I'm going to go past 1, closer to 2 in the negative direction. I'm calling that D. My graph is a very specific anyway, so. Okay, does that sound a teeny bit familiar? Do we need to connect to it at all? No. No, this was just kind of reminding you how they work. We also last year talked about absolute value of a complex number. Now, definition of absolute value is distance from zero. So absolute value of a complex number when it's an ordered pair like this is going to be distance from the center, distance from zero, zero. So when we do absolute value 
of something in the form A plus BI. We're going to do the square root of A squared plus B squared. So in order to know the absolute value of a complex number, you have to know your real part and your imaginary part, and then use the formula. And really is technically finding like the hypotenuse of a right triangle is really what it's doing. So, okay, so A, the absolute value of 3 plus 4i. Well, remember this is in the form of absolute value of A plus BI, right? We're going to do square root of A squared plus B squared. So square root of what? Okay. 3 squared plus 4 squared. 3 squared is 9. 4 squared is 16. 9 plus 16 is 25. So the square root of 25, which is? 5. Oh, is it not plus or minus? It is not plus or minus. This is not a situation where we're taking the square root in an equation setting. This is just a formula, and the formula just says the positive square root. So the I is kind of right. The I is not, when it's the absolute value of A squared plus B squared, I is not part of the B value. B is just the coefficient of I, so just the number in front of I. Okay, so yeah, don't use the I. Now... <clears throat> B. I would argue technically you could find the absolute value of this without a formula. Because what did I say definition of absolute value was? Distance from, zero. Distance from zero. How far is negative 2i going to be from zero? It's going to be 2 away, yes? Now, will my formula prove that? Yes. It will. This is going to be doing the square root of... Zero squared plus negative two squared. Zero squared plus negative two squared, which zero squared is zero. Negative two squared is four. Zero plus four is four. The square root of four is two. Kind of the answer you expected there. And we can find that one pretty easy because it's just straight out on an axis, right? When you go at a diagonal, you have to think more like a hypotenuse, but that one was just straight out. Work out as a number? No, not necessarily. It, because it could just be the square root of a number, which is a decimal. Okay, what about C? Another one that technically could be done without the, the formula. Negative square root of 2 squared, so negative 2 squared, which is square root 4, which is 2. It should be square root 2. Yeah. I think we lost a square root in there we somewhere. Yeah. Square and I was not. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I so. Okay, so if we use our formula, <laughs> A is negative square root of 2. So negative square root of 2 squared plus B is 0, so officially our 0 squared. Negative square root of 2 squared. So negative square root of 2 times negative square root of 2. You multiply by itself, it's just. 2, but then you still have the 2 under the square root there. So that one is yeah, just square root of 2. No, I was wrong. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think you just lost a square root in there somewhere, but I'm not, yeah. That one, it's a hard one. Sometimes it's easy to follow when we say stuff out loud, and sometimes there's a lot of 2s and square roots in this one. It gets confusing real quick. Okay, what about D? We're actually going to have to work D, aren't we? Yeah. Okay. What is my A value? Negative 1. Okay. A is negative 1. So square root of negative 1 squared plus, what is my B value? Negative square root of 5. Only because I's, we don't traditionally put an I or a variable after a square root. So that's why it's written before. Okay. But still, the part multiplied by it is the B part. So it is a negative square root of 5 that we are squaring there in the B position. Negative 1 squared is? 1. one. Negative square root of 5 squared? Five. 5. 1 plus 5? Six. 6. Square root of 6? 2 squared. Could you do it like that too? 
No, because it doesn't divide by a perfect oh, square. Never mind. <laughs> you were adding four and two, weren't you? Yeah. Okay. That would be the answer for eight. Yeah, as soon as you said that, I was like, oh, wait. Yeah. I was trying to be simple. I'm glad you're trying to simplify it. However, I, wrong number there. It's okay. Yeah. A for it. There you go. Okay. That's more the algebra two review, yes? Now, as we go into this next part, we are looking at trig form of a complex number in polar form. Okay, so we know our complex number, the whole form of A plus BI. That's, you know, like when we talk rectangular form. But when we talk about trig form of a complex number, we're looking at that right there. Z equals R times cosine theta plus I sine theta. And really, it should look somewhat familiar because if you distribute that R, you're going to have R cosine theta plus R sine theta times I. But realizing the A value is represented by R cosine theta, B value is represented by R sine theta. We've done that before, but with X and Y, right? So very similar. R, well, that's your radius. That's how far we go out from the center. That's your absolute value of A plus BI. So the square root of A squared plus B squared again. And then theta, tangent theta, we're used to saying Y over X. But in terms of our complex numbers, we're going to use B over A. Okay. Now I'm trying to keep an eye on time, so I want to make sure we get to the back side. But I want to talk about one or two of these. On A, they give us the complex number 1 minus I. Our job is to write it in the trig form of a complex number. So our job is to write it in that form right there, the R times cosine theta plus I times sine theta. Now, this means we first have to find, or one of the things we have to find is R. How do I find R? Square root of a squared plus b squared. So in this case, square root of 1 squared plus negative 1 squared. 1 squared is 1. Negative 1 squared is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. And so here we're going to have square root of 2 for the r value. We also need to find tangent theta. Okay. If we talk about, or if we need to find theta, sorry. So if we use the idea of tangent theta is B over A. So tangent theta is equal to what's B? Negative one. Divided by what's A? One. one. And negative one divided by one is negative one. Yeah, it's the idea of thinking inverse. Um, we're looking at when does tangent equal negative 1? Now, technically, how many answers do we have when I ask that question? Four, one, oh, two, three. Two. Since it's negative, when does tangent equal negative 1? There's two in negative quadrants, yes. And then there would be two in positive quadrants. But So in this case, we only would need two of them. Right? Because it's when does tangent equal a negative one. So there's technically two answers. Now, we only need one of them. And so we're going to need to figure out which one. So go back and think. If you look at the complex number 1 minus i, where is that when we graph 1 minus i? Yeah. One negative one. So write one down one. I heard in quadrant four. I heard in C quadrant is in the cosine quadrant. Now, so does that make sense? Because I'm looking for when tangent is negative. Is tangent negative in quadrant four? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now ask yourself, forget the negative for a moment. When does tangent equal one? High over four. High over four according to our chart. What is the pi over 4 angle in quadrant 4? Okay. 
7 pi over 4. I mean, technically, theta could also be represented with, what is it, 3 pi over 4? Because tangent would also be negative 1 at 3 pi over 4. However, we want the one that represents the given point. So we want to use 7 pi over 4. So we have our other piece here. We're ready to write this in the trig form. So I'm going to say z equals r, which r was square root of 2 times cosine of theta, which is 7 pi over 4 plus i times sine of theta, which is again 7 pi over 4. And that's your answer. Because we're looking for the equivalent trig form. Now, to be all honest, if you multiplied this all out, like if you did cosine of 7 pi over 4, sine of 7 pi over 4, and multiply by square root of 2, you would get 1 minus i. If done correctly, and you put this in your calculator, you would get the 1 minus i values. Um, I'm going to do B. I don't know that I'll do any others. B is just, um, it's a little bit different, so I wanted to do B. I don't know. Are you ready to talk B? So if you're trying the calculator test on me, making sure I'm being truthful here. Did you know there's an I bit on our calculator? I did. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, let's do B. She's, she's, she's truthing. Truth? Yeah, she's truthing us. Okay. Yeah. Negative 3i, which in A minus BI form would be 0, zero minus 3i, right? Or 0, negative 3 is normally pair. Okay, so what about R? Negative 3 squared plus 0 squared. Okay, 0 squared, square root of 0 squared plus negative 3 squared. Negative 3 squared is 9. The square root of 9 takes us right back to 3. Although if you think about it, 0 minus 3i, you're just going out 3 on an axis. So, yeah, you should get 3. Okay, let's talk about our theta. Tangent of theta, b over a. <coughs> What's three Negative 3 over 0. What happens when we divide by 0? We can't, can we? If 0 is on top, it's 0. But when 0 is on bottom, we can't do this, guys. Now, do you guys remember anything about the tangent graph? Because the tangent graph, remember, it looks like cubics, right? An increasing graph, and then there's a asymptote. Increasing graph, asymptote, right? Those undefined places are the asymptotes, is what we're looking at. Now, so you're looking for a spot where tangent is undefined. You're also looking for a spot where the denominator is zero, which would be cosine. So you're looking for a spot where cosine is zero. Or where is zero minus three I graphed at? Down. Left or right? Zero and down three. Does that help us figure out the angle? Three pi over two. Yeah, that angle is 3 pi over 2 there. And if you do a little thinking, guess what? Is cosine 0 at 3 pi over 2? Yeah. It is. Because left or right 0, so at pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, cosine is 0. We need this one down here. So we don't just get to write no solution? No, you do not. Sorry. Are there any no solutions? Or is there always a solution? I think there's always a solution. So. What? 
Okay, let's write our Z out. So R, which is 3 times cosine of 3 pi over 2 plus I times sine of 3 pi over 2. Okay, I would love to do C and D, but I would rather make sure I get an example of multiplying and an example of dividing in. Okay? The multiplying and dividing are the newest part today, but it's really just following a formula. So, part four on the back side is multiplying and dividing complex numbers. So, given Z1 and Z2. So Z1 representing a complex number, Z2 representing a complex number. Notice Z1 is listed as R1 times cosine theta 1 plus I sine theta 1. Z2 is the same thing but with twos. So as you look at this, we will start with Z1 times Z2 and notice the formula up there. Z1 times Z2, it's R1 times R2 out front. And then it's cosine, and you're adding the two thetas, plus I sine, and you're adding the two thetas. Division is very similar, just slight difference with dividing and subtracting there. So we're going to practice using this formula. In example A here, if Z is given as 5 times cosine of 3 pi over 5 plus I sine 3 pi over 5, and W is given 7 cosine pi over 3 plus I sine pi over 3, then they're asking us to find ZW and Z divided by W. So we're going to start with finding ZW. If we're going to start with finding ZW, we first need to know R1 times R2. What's R1? Five. Five. In other words, the R from one value, and what's the R2? Seven. seven. So we're going to start off doing 5 times 7. And then we're going to say cosine of, and it's theta 1 plus theta 2. What are my thetas? Okay, theta 1 is 3 pi over 5. Plus theta 2 pi over 3, plus i times sine of 3 pi over 5, plus pi over 3. Your job really is to clean it up at this point. 5 times 7 is 35, cosine Oh no, we have to do a little bit of math. 3 pi over 5 plus pi over 3. I'm going to add those with common denominator 15. Multiply by 3. I have 9 pi over 15. Multiply by 5 and I have 5 pi over 15. So 9 pi over 15 plus 5 pi over 15 is... 14 pi over 15. I don't know if we needed that side note or not, but you got it. So this is going to be cosine of 14 pi over 15 plus I times sine of 14 pi over 15. Okay, this right here is your trig form, which I believe is what they asked for in homework. Okay, this is your trig form of the complex number, ZW. You don't go any farther than that if they want the trig form. Now, if they wanted just the complex number itself, you could put this in the calculator and multiply it. And if you put it in the calculator and multiply it, kind of like what a couple of you were doing earlier to check me, negative 34.24 plus 7.28i. 
that's what it would be equivalent to as just a regular complex number. But again, I think they want that middle line there, if I recall correctly. And we need to practice finding z divided by w. Really the difference is, instead of multiplying r's, you divide r's. Instead of adding thetas, you subtract thetas. So z divided by w, I'm going to do, not z divided by w, goodness, r1 divided by r2. 5 divided by 7, and then it's cosine, and this time it's going to be 3 pi over 5 minus pi over 3 minus i times sine of the same thing. 3 pi over 5 minus pi over 3. Yes, It does. Okay. My apologies. Did I say the wrong thing too, I take it? My apologies. So it is a plus between cosine and sine. It's minuses between the two thetas. My apologies there if I said that incorrect. Thank you. Okay. Five divided by seven. Easy, easiest if you're leaving this in trig form, leave it as five divided by seven. We can clean up our thetas, cosine of 3 pi over 5 minus pi over 3. What'd you say? Yep, I agree. I changed my math over there. So cosine of 4 pi over 15 plus I sine of 4 pi over 15. Okay, again, right there is your trig form, if that's what they ask for, which I am pretty sure that's what they ask for. If you just put it in regular complex number, I have 0 0.48 plus 0.53i. And again, that would be done with the calculator. Okay, on page 511, 1 through 6 and 19 through 26 is what you're being asked to work. Juniors, bring them back tomorrow. Seniors, bring them back Wednesday. Okay? Or bring it back tomorrow if you want, but not required until Wednesday for seniors. I'm going to grab my Oh. <laughs>